Well, hello everybody. Um, we're doing another time of worshiping from home and, um, and today I'm singing to you from my living room. So from my living room to yours, from my heart to yours, welcome to worship. <laughs> So today, help us to meet you. Help us to see you in the beauty that's around us. This unique experience has us poised um, to discover you in new ways, to find you in the ordinary, in an extraordinary way. God, open our hearts, open our minds, open our very lives to your love. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. John 21, 1 through 19, Jesus appears to seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, 
Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. Good morning, Woodmont. Would you join me for a word of prayer? Loving God, open our hearts and minds and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I hope all of you are well and are staying healthy. Uh, I've had a number of you reach out and ask me when we will be able to come back uh, together to have worship here at the church. And the answer to that question is that we still uh, don't quite know. Uh, we do know that some of the stay-at-home orders uh, may be lifted later this week, and Mayor Cooper has rolled out a four-phase uh, reopening plan for Nashville that's going to be driven by the data uh, and by testing. Um, and as a church, we want to be responsible. Uh, there are many different factors that we have to uh, consider in those decisions. We have a number of senior members. We have a lot of children that come to our Sunday school. Um, we want to make sure that this building is cleaned well. So we're still talking through all of that. The board and the elders and the staff have been talking about that and what that looks like. And as soon as we uh, make decisions on that, we're going to uh, let you know and communicate that. But in the meantime, uh, we are looking into the possibility of some uh, drive-up services uh, out in our front parking lot that may happen during the month of May that could be an in-between step. Uh, so stay tuned, and we will uh, inform you uh, of what is being decided 
uh, in terms of what's next. Today is our final week in John's Gospel. We have been in John's Gospel since uh, January, so four months in John's Gospel. Uh, and today we are going to conclude this series on John, and we come to the final chapter, which is John uh, chapter 21. We found that John's Gospel is unique. It is different from the other three that we call the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John's Gospel is beautiful. It's poetic. Um, it has uh, many details and different things that we don't find in the other Gospels, and we haven't been able to cover the entire Gospel, so that's why I've asked you to read and study it uh, on your own. But today we come to chapter 21, where Jesus appears to his disciples for a third time after the resurrection. And when this happens, it takes place on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we find Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, James, John, and two other disciples who uh, are fishing together. And apparently, uh, we, we, we find out that they're not catching anything. They're not having any luck fishing. It's early in the morning and Jesus appears to them and says, children, you have no fish, have you? No, they respond. Then Jesus says, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they do that and they, they catch a ton of fish. So many fish that they can barely even reel them into the boat. And as soon as this happens, John says to Peter, it is the Lord. And Peter, who was apparently uh, fishing without any clothes on, uh, puts some clothes on and he jumps in the water and presumably he starts to swim towards Jesus who is on the shore. And the other disciples bring the boat with all the fish back into the shore and Jesus is waiting there for them and he has a fire going. And, and John tells us that he invites them to breakfast to cook some of the fish that they have just caught. I've been thinking about this picture. The disciples are fishing and they're not catching any fish. Remember, this is how many of them made a living. They would go out on the Sea of Galilee and they would fish and then they would sell the fish for a profit. And Jesus suddenly appears to them and says, cast your net on the right side of the boat. And they do that and what happens? They catch a ton of fish. The nets are full. As we look towards starting to re-emerge from this quarantine time, and it's gonna be slow and we have to be smart and we have to be responsible and we have to be careful. What's going to change in our lives? If we've been fishing on one side of the boat and, and we haven't been catching any fish, if we've been frustrated, then how are we going to throw our nets on the other side of the boat? And how are things going to be different? That's the question that I want to raise this morning. That's the question that I want you to think about today. What behavior patterns are going to change in your life as a result of the coronavirus? What habits are you going to form that maybe you didn't have before as a result of this time period that we've been going through together? I think this is an important question to ask. As we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as it fills us with new life and new hope, how is our life going to be different moving forward? I've had a lot of conversations with people over the past month in, in groups, on the phone, in Bible studies, on Zoom. Um, and this question of how is life going to be different after the coronavirus is the question that, that keeps coming up and that people keep talking about because life has certainly been different during the coronavirus and during the quarantine, but how is it going to be different after this and, and after we get through this time? And so I've been thinking about this myself and I've been asking lots of different people what they think about this. And this morning, what I'd like to share with you are seven basic ideas or thoughts of how our behavior, 
how our habits are going to be different after we get through this time. So first, people have said, I'm not going to be as busy as I used to be. I hear this from a lot of parents. I was so tired of running and going and never slowing down. I didn't realize how much I would pack into a week or into a day until all of a sudden everything was canceled. And I had no plans, nowhere to be, nowhere to go, nothing to do. Practices were canceled, plays were canceled, PTA meetings were canceled, small groups were canceled. And so people have said, all of a sudden, it just dawned on me how much I was trying to do in a given week. And it was too much. And so now there is a commitment that I sense to simplifying life and not overcrowding it, to not running ourselves into the ground. Secondly, people have said, I didn't realize how fragile our health is. And this virus has has not just infected older people or people that have uh, existing medical conditions. It's also infected younger people, people who thought that they were otherwise uh, pretty healthy. And so I've heard people say, you know, man, I always just took my health and the health of my family for granted. I didn't think about it a lot. But for people who have lost a family member or a friend to uh, the coronavirus, and now it's it is. Uh, caused over 50,000 deaths in the United States and, and even more than that worldwide. This has really hit home, especially in places like New York City, where so many people know somebody who has uh, died as a result of this virus. And so a lot of people are saying, you know, I don't want to take my health for granted anymore. I don't want to neglect it. Exercising and eating right and sleeping enough and 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 and, and and finding healthy outlets for stress. These are things that I wanna do moving forward. My grandfather, who was a minister in Florida, used to say, if you have your health, you have everything. And I think that what he meant was, if you have your health, then, then you know the sky is the limit, but so many of us take our health for granted and we need to stop doing that. We need to take care of it. Third, I've heard people say the coronavirus has reminded me of how important it is to have a faith and a healthy spiritual life. You see, when something happens in life that is completely out of our control, but it affects us in a, in a big way, we have to find a way to deal with that because we can't just fix it. We're used to being able to fix things like this, but we can't just fix it. So what having faith and a healthy spiritual life looks like is, is basically learning to live and accept the uncertainty that's always there in life. We learn to pray the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and give me the wisdom to know the difference. And a healthy spiritual life, a healthy prayer life, helps us know the difference and helps us live with the things that are in our control and the things that are out of our control. And we've all had to realize that this situation is largely out of our control. There are things we can do to cope with it, but we, we cannot uh, control this. Trying to control things that are outside of our control will, will drive us absolutely crazy. And if you've ever tried to control something that's outside of your control, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. And we've all tried to do that. Fourth, I've heard people say how important it is to invest in key relationships. You know, some of us try to keep up with with everybody and that's impossible. But sometimes in our attempt to keep up with everybody, we neglect the most important relationships that are in our life. Later in this passage, in John 21, we have Jesus and Peter having a heart-to-heart conversation. And Jesus asks Peter three times, which, by the way, is the same number of times uh, that Peter denied him. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And every time uh, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then what does Jesus say in return? He says, tend my sheep, feed my lambs. 
In other words, care for other people the way that I have cared for you. And I think it starts with the people that we're closest to. It starts in our marriage. It starts in our family. It starts with our our children. It starts with our close friends. But some of our circles need to get a little bit smaller because when we try to keep up with everybody, we often neglect the people that deserve our best, the people that we're closest to. And so I think we need to identify the key relationships in our lives and invest in those. Fifth, I've heard a lot of people say that the coronavirus has reminded them that work is not the end all be all. In America, we have a tendency to define ourselves by our work. I do it. Many of you do it. When we meet a new person, what's one of the first things that we ask them? What do you do? What do you do for a living? But what somebody does is not the same thing as who they are. What somebody does is just a part of their life, but it's not their entire life. And I think that this time of quarantine has caused many of us to realize that, that maybe we were workaholics or maybe our life had just gotten out of balance. That's true that so many people wrap up all of their meaning and purpose in their work and they attach their, their worth to how successful they are in their work. And men are often really guilty of, of this and some women as well. But, but our character should define who we are. And our priorities should define who we are. And the way that we treat other people, that should define who we are. You know, workaholism is a false god in this culture. And, and people have been discovering that they can get a lot more done in a shorter period of time than they ever thought that they could. And so work needs to be kept in perspective. This pandemic has reminded all of us that, that, that family life matters. This is my sixth point. Family life is important and it matters. Not only does the nuclear family matter, but extended family matters as well. And people have not been able to see their grandchildren and their nieces and their nephews for a long period of time. And for some people, that's normal. They don't see their family often. And for other people, that's been very uh, difficult because they're used to seeing their family. Um, Some people are going through this quarantine all alone and by themselves. And we've been trying to reach out as a church to folks who are living by themselves. Maybe they're single or divorced. Maybe they lost a spouse recently. Um, For the first time in in two months, I actually got to see in person from a distance, uh, my father, uh, my brother, my sister-in-law, and my niece, who's now four months old. I haven't seen them in two months. And, And that was such a refreshing feeling to sit out on a porch Uh, away from each other and just to actually see each other in person and not on a computer screen. Family is important. And and I think all of us know that, but we often don't live as if we know that. And my heart goes out to people who have lost family members during this pandemic, who've lost family members to to COVID-19. People who've lived in nursing homes that have been hard hit different parts of the country, even here in, in middle Tennessee, but we need to treasure family and we need to invest in it. And we need to remember that it's one of life's greatest gifts. And seventh and lastly, this morning, this time has reminded us that as Christians, our personal relationship with Christ matters. Because when you take away being able to gather at church and when you take away programs and being able to come together for groups and Bible studies, it's much more difficult to hide behind religion. Like Peter and John, we either have a personal relationship with Christ or we don't. And many people who are Christians don't have that in their lives. They go to church, they might even be in a Bible study or a a small group, but they don't know Christ on a, on a personal level. And that's so important because in a time like this, if you have a relationship with Christ, then he is there and he is present and he comforts us and he challenges us and he gets us to think about things that maybe we're not thinking about. And so I would challenge you and ask you the question, do you have that relationship with Christ? Not in some weird 
overly pious way, but, but do you invest in that? Do you read the scriptures to see what he taught and what he did and how he lived and how you can pattern your life after his? That's what discipleship in the Christian life is all about. And I believe that Jesus will show us the way if we are open and if we will listen. Those are seven thoughts that I have about how life might change and how our behaviors and habits might change as we begin to slowly uh, reemerge from this time of quarantine. I wanna close with another story this week. It's a story uh, that I love. It's another fisherman's story and uh, some of you have heard it, but it fits this message of how life can be different and how maybe we need to cast our nets on the other side of the boat, like Jesus told the disciples. But the story is about a man who was a businessman in New York and he had an MBA from Harvard and and he would, uh, every summer, he would take a two week vacation to this small coastal fishing town in Mexico. And he did that to unwind and to relax and to get away from the big city. And so one summer he was down there on his vacation and he was standing by the shore and he looked out and he saw all the boats were out fishing but he saw this one small fishing boat coming back in. And it was early in the day Uh, So he didn't really understand. So he walked down uh, to see uh, what this guy was doing because curiosity kind of overtook him. And so he walked up to the boat and he said, he said, uh, uh, he said, how are you doing? And the man said, hi, hi, how are you? He said, "Uh, how long did it take you to catch those fish? The guy had three or four yellowfin tuna in his boat. Oh, not that long, the fisherman said with a smile. Well, is there something wrong with your boat? The man said, no, nothing is wrong with my boat. Well, why did you come in early? Well, I I just caught enough fish and I was ready to come back in. It's not even lunchtime yet, the businessman said. Why would you come in so soon? And the fisherman said, well, here's my day. He said, usually when I wake up, I, uh, you know, I sleep late. And um, I wake up in the late morning, I come out and I go and and I fish for a couple hours, mostly just because I enjoy it. So then in the afternoon, I, I, I go and I, I play with my children and I take a siesta with my wife. And then in the evenings, I, I go home and have dinner with my family, which I enjoy. And, and then once my family goes to bed, I stroll into town and I, I sip wine and play guitar uh, with my amigos. Well, the American businessman scoffed at that schedule and he said, well, buddy, let me tell you something. You're in luck. I've got an MBA from Harvard and I'm on vacation, but I'm going to help you out. You're going to help me out? Yes, I'm going to help you out and tell you how you can be more effective in your fishing business. Okay, the fisherman said. He says, this is what you should do. He said, you need to fish later into the day so you can catch more fish and buy a bigger boat. He said, then once you get a bigger boat, you can catch even more fish and make more money. Then you can buy a second boat and get other people to come and and fish for you. Well, then what would I do, the fisherman said. He said, well, now we're getting started. He said, with two boats, you can catch even more fish. You can make even more money and you can buy a fleet of boats boats, and you can have a fishing company with a whole crew of folks working for your business. Well, then what would I do? The fisherman said, said, well, before too long, you know, you can, you can start your own crannery and then you can leave this coastal town. You can move to Mexico city and you can manage your, your growing fishing enterprise. Well, then what would I do? The businessman was asked by the fisherman. Well, then he said, you can move to Los Angeles. You can open a distribution plant on the West Coast and you can start to fish all over the globe, multiple continents, Asia, Australia, Europe. And then you can come to New York, which is where I live, and you can list your company on the New York Stock Exchange as a publicly traded company and you will make so much money, more money than you've ever dreamed of making. Well, what would I do after that? The fisherman asked. And with that question, the American businessman was stumped. And he said, well, I guess after that, you can move to a small Mexican village and and you can sleep late and and you could fish just for the joy of fishing and and then you could go home and you could take a siesta with your wife and play with your kids and then at night you could stroll to town and sip wine and 
play guitar with your amigos. You see, bigger isn't always better and busier isn't always better. How will our lives change once we get through this situation that we've been in? Would you join me in prayer? Loving God, as we continue to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, help all of us to ask this question, what does it look like to throw our nets on the other side of the boat? Teach us important lessons about life, about living, and help us to look to Christ as our example. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. I come to you live from the prayer garden here at church. Such a beautiful and peaceful and sacred place. It's a place that I've come often to lift up whatever's on my heart. 
in this time of Corona, I feel like there's so many things um, to pray for, so many people and situations. I know we each come this morning with um, heavy hearts, with things that we do want to lift up to God. So I'd like to give you this moment, um, quiet, to take a deep breath. Uh, maybe you listen to the water behind me and lift up, close your eyes and lift up whatever is on your hearts this morning. And then we'll go together to God in prayer. Let's have a moment of silence. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks in this quiet moment that we can speak our hearts and know with confidence that you are listening. Corona has us riding a pendulum of emotions from fear to hope and back again. In this liminal space, I believe you want us to see that faith is so much more than a set of beliefs. It is the journey of our life. It includes the ups and downs, the moments of insecurity and fear, doubts where we wonder where you are and if you're even listening. It also includes the deep longing for something more than this world can offer us. More of you, God. More of that peace that is beyond our understanding. More love. A love that is pure and non-judgmental. A love that is patient and forgiving and comes without conditions. If we've learned anything over these last weeks, God, it is that you are constantly surprising us with your grace. Please don't stop. We need like never before to be assured that something beautiful and redemptive is unfolding, even and especially when we cannot see it. Our job, God, is to pay attention to what is happening around us, but more importantly, within us. May we never stop looking for you counting on you. You are our rock. May we dig deeper in these times for the holiness that you planted inside us. Because more than ever, the world needs to see us shine brighter, to speak more love words, to be extra generous and kind. Dear God, over the coming weeks, as we try to adjust to the new normal, infuse us with an extra dose of courage gentleness with ourselves and others, abundant patience, and a renewed hope so that we can bravely step forward. I pray now that you would rush in with healing, that you would open your arms wide and bring us in closer to you. So many are hurting, many in silence. Make your presence known to them and to all of us. And finally, God, thank you for helping us to see again what truly matters, how ridiculously sacred the journey is. So many blessings, even in this time of hardship. God, thank you for the profundity and the gravity of love. There's nothing quite like the love that you show us. It has this remarkable power to lift us up, to make us braver than we think we are to ask us to be beacons of hope for others. You know, God, that over these last weeks, all of us have fallen short in love. We've let people down. We've let ourselves down. So thank you for your willingness, willingness to forgive us, to offer us chances to try again, to do better in your name. Dear God, please know how grateful we are that we have you to lean into. It is now in faith and hope that we say your holy prayer together as one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our blessings and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I think that one of my favorite images of Jesus is found in John 21, this week's passage. Here is the resurrected Christ, the conqueror of death, risen in all of his glory, and he's making breakfast. He's still serving this ragtag group of disciples that had abandoned him not so long ago. He's providing them with nourishment, both body and soul. Jesus is also setting an example for his followers. In his conversation with Peter, Jesus offers the disciple who denied him three times three lifelines that bring healing. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs, and then take care of my sheep, and then feed my sheep. Just as Jesus had always fed and cared for and provided spiritual direction and healing for his disciples that day, every day in fact, and just the way he did those things for everyone that came into contact with him, he was telling Peter to simply follow his example. If you love me, Make breakfast, forgive, love, be Christ-like. Our offerings are a response to this question, do you love me? When we give to the church, we are helping feed Christ's lambs. When we bring canned goods to a drive through food drive, like so many of you did for the Nashville Food Project last week, we are taking care of Christ's sheep. When we help a child do his spelling homework when school is not in session, when we call someone to see how they're doing, when we make a grocery run for an immunocompromised neighbor, all of that is taking care of Christ's sheep. We are feeding Christ's sheep. Love, forgiveness, compassion, taking care of each other, giving our offerings, our time, our talents, just like our students next week will give their talents in leading in worship. All of these things are answers to the question, do you love me? And as the theologian David Dark says often, there are so many ways to love God. And so may we take this time in which we give our offerings, our talent, our time, our money, our whatever, to remember that there are so many ways to love God. And so let's answer that question, do you love me? with a resounding, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, and I'll feed your sheep. Let us pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us and for forgiving us and offering us hope. And may we love you in return. Take these offerings of our money, our time, our resources, our abilities, our very selves, and may they all go towards feeding, helping, comforting, and loving your beloved children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Several times after Jesus was raised from the dead, after the very first Easter, he appeared to his disciples. Now many times when he did, he did so over a meal. Not every single time, but many times. For example, it tells us in the book of Luke that one time he was in the upper room with his disciples, and the disciples didn't believe that he was real. They thought that he was some sort of ghost or apparition or or vision. And so he took a piece of fish that was right there on the table, and he ate it right in front of them as if to say, hey, can a ghost do that? I am real. And then another time he appeared to his disciples at a fireside breakfast on the beach of the Sea of Galilee, which we heard about today in our scripture reading. And then still another time he went to the village of Emmaus, which was just outside of Jerusalem. And he sat down at a table with two of his followers and the followers didn't recognize him at that point. They didn't know that Jesus was in their midst. But then Jesus took bread and he broke it right in front of them. And then suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him and they realized that Jesus was there with them. Friends, my hope and my prayer is that the same is true for us today. Wherever we happen to be, in our kitchens, in our living rooms, whatever elements we have in front of us, I hope and pray that when we break the bread that we realize that Jesus is right 
there with us, that he will never leave us or forsake us, and that, in fact, he has never left our side. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would make yourself known to us in the breaking of the bread and in the lifting up the cup. Help us to feel your presence, to know that you are near, and we pray all of this in the name of the risen Jesus. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord and Savior took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you in the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, this is the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the gifts of God for the people of God. So all together we say, thanks be to God. thank everybody for worshiping with us this week. 
Also want to thank uh, everybody uh, for uh, participating. A lot of you participated in the food drive last week to help the Nashville Food Project. I know Tulu and her team are grateful for that. I also want to say a word to our fifth graders who made their uh, confession of faith uh, this spring. Uh, we got to see it on video. We're proud of you. Thank you, Justin, uh, and uh, mentors for all the work that you've done. Um, and we look forward to the baptisms happening uh, at some point, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully in the near future. Um, and then lastly, we're going to continue to talk uh, with the leadership about uh, a potential uh, drive-in church option uh, and, and how we can do that safely with the social distancing. And then whatever decisions are made, we'll be communicating those to you. Uh, let us prepare now for our benediction. Go forth now and live, leaving your worries, your fears, your troubles, and your sorrows behind. Take in their place faith and hope and love, for these are the gifts from Christ to all of you. Amen.